Line and everyone who's in the room to this session, which is called Transforming Healthcare uh, Through Digital Tools and Artificial Intelligence. Uh, my name is Kerry Adams, and I'm the CEO of the Union for International Cancer Control based in Geneva. I also sit on the boards and advisory boards of many groups, including the NCD Alliance, a law centre, as well as uh, an organisation which we established a couple of years ago, which is a foundation helping cities around the world. Um, I think I was chosen to do this because I did an economic computing and statistics degree back in 1985. Okay, so that's the connection between me and digital. All right, so I'm looking for lots of great questions from the audience and from online uh, once we've had our presentations. And we have 11 or 12 presentations, which will all stick to around about six minutes in order for us to get through the session with some space at the end for questions. So. Um, are there any questions from anyone in the audience at the moment, or shall we proceed? Is everyone clear on the, the process? So one presentation at a time, and we'll keep it going, and then we'll do Q&A at the end. I would encourage you to put questions onto the app. Those of you who have been familiar with the app can use that. However, we do have a, a microphone, and the lady has very kindly said she will run around with it if you want to ask questions by putting your hand up as well. So on that basis, I think we will move on to the first speaker. And the first speaker is going to be in reverse order because he has to get a flight out quickly after this. So Tom Balthazar, perhaps you could come up to the stage. And Tom um, is talking about, is informed consent necessary when using artificial intelligence as clinical decision support? Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you, President. Dear colleagues in Barcelona and maybe all over the world, um, during this conference, there has been a lot talked about the patient as the center of everything and also about the new digital tools. And one of the questions uh, sometimes uh, that is asked is when you are using artificial intelligence, is it necessary to inform the patient that you will be doing it? And moreover, is it necessary to ask consent from the patient uh, when you want to use artificial intelligence and especially artificial intelligence as a clinical decision support. Um, informed consent, it's uh, in most laws in most countries, it has, uh, it's very important in, in medical ethics, of course, and it's always uh, named as a couple, but in fact, it's a couple with two partners. First, there is information and not only information about your actual health status, what is your diagnosis, what do we know about you, but also the information that is necessary to give consent to the treatment and the information about the, the proposed or the conceived treatment, uh, what will we do, what is the purpose, what are the risks, what are the benefits, what are the dangers, and very important, are there, are there alternatives, are there tr other treatments possible? And after this information is given, you can ask the patient to, uh, to consent to the treatment. Now, I think that although there is not much written about it, but before AI, it was not necessary to give the patient information about really all the scientific and technological details of the treatment. For example, when you are using a CT scan, you don't have to explain how the CT scan works when you are using an MRI, when you are using an echography, you don't have to explain all the aspects, and even most doctors don't know all these technical aspects about the way these machines are functioning. When blood is analyzed, you don't have to explain all the way and all the scientific and technical details about the, the, the analyzing of blood. And I think the same is the case for the treatment. Of course, there is an explanation necessary about what is relevant about the treatment, but the exact way that um, uh, surgery in all its details is carried out, that uh, when a little tripter is used for reins, how this uh, machine works, I don't think it's necessary to inform the patient about all these details. Now, what will uh, artificial intelligence uh, change? Artificial intelligence can uh, play several roles in the phases of the diagnosis and in the phase of the treatment. In the phase of the diagnosis, it can help 
the physician, it can help the physician, it supports him or her uh, as a clinical decision support, or it can really determine the diagnosis. For example, in uh, determining the diagnosis of a CT scan or an RX um, radiography, it can help the, the radiologist to make the diagnosis or, and it's a subtle, it's a subtle difference, it can really say this is the diagnosis. Concerning the therapy, normally artificial intelligence will be used to help the physician. This can be the best therapy. Uh, we can propose you the therapy on analyzing all the scientific uh, details uh, that, that we know. But, and it's a subtle difference, of course, it can really determine the choice of the therapy. And I think when you are thinking about uh, is it necessary to inform and to ask consent for the patient, it's important to try to, to make the difference between clinical decision support and really determining diagnosis or therapy. Thinking about the uh, information that has be, to be given to the patient, I think that it's necessary always to give information about relevant risks, what could be relevant risks when using uh, artificial intelligence. It could be inaccuracy that you are not sure if it works, or it could be the famous black box problem that you don't really know how the system uh, works. And of course, and that's really very difficult, you can inform the patient about alternatives. Uh, for example, one of the alternatives can be not using AI at all and working at the, the classical way, the older way, the ancient way, or to use other types, other types of software if they are uh, prevailable, of course. Asking for consent, I think that it's not always necessary but when AI will be used as more than clinical decision support, so when it really determines, I think it's really uh, necessary and certainly it has to be done when there is a reasonable alternat alternative, when according to the, the scientific standards of this moment, um, reasonably it can be uh, justified to use AI, but it can be good medicine as well not to use AI. And at that moment, I think that the consent has to be asked for the patient. But of course, and that's really a key question, and maybe it's not a legal question, but it's more, I think, a, a general policy message. When we say that it's sometimes necessary that doctors will inform patients about the dangers and the risks and the alternatives in AI, they have to be eager and it has to be possible that they uh, inform their patients. And I think at that moment that all the doctors are not able to do that because they uh, were not trained or they are not trained about how to use AI and they are certainly not always trained about uh, how these algorithms works, what is the famous black box problem on which scientific details it was analyzed. And I think that, and that's maybe a more a policy message to education, although you, you read it a lot, that it's very important that in the, the basic training, but also in the continuous training, doctors really are trained in how AI works, what can you do with it, what is... Um, yeah. In, yes. Okay. No, no, no. But but, but but the clock is ticking. This is my final slide. So oh, there you, you go. Very Fantastic. Much. This there was you my go. message. I, thank I, you, I, President. Sorry, I, I, I no, embarrassed you. you I you already at, at the beginning of the session. You showed that you're very good, President. There you go. Excellent. Right. So let's and, move. Thank you very much. And I have to much. excuse uh, me, but I really have to take a plane uh, at three o'clock, and it seems that uh, we will forward the questions to you. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. <laughs> Carmen Harans. Is Carmen here? Carmen? No. Okay. Let's go on to Anna Gil Carrasco. Hello, Anna. Hello. Anna will be talking about the development of an app to support clinical decision making and promote the standardization of practice of pediatric nurses. Your pressured seven minutes starts now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hello to everyone. Uh, my name is Anna Gil. I'm a nurse practitioner in the pediatric uh, emergency department of San Juan de los Hospital here in Barcelona. I'm, first of all, I want to uh, thank the organization to allow me to be here today. 
I'm really proud to be here to present the, the project called Development of an App uh, to Support Clinical Decision Making and Promote the Standardization of Practice of Pediatric Nurses that we have been developing uh, jointly with other two nurses, Jose Manuel Blanco and Pilar Ornillos, a uh, telecommunications engineer, Arnau Weiss, and institutional support. As everybody knows, nurses as other healthcare practitioners need to consult sources of knowledge in their daily practice for decision making, calculate or solving doubts, even if they have a large experience. Getting this information from formal sources based on scientifically evidence is usually difficult during existence, especially in critical or emergency situations where quick and concrete answers are needed and support resources are approachless at bedside. Traditional consultation systems such as books or digital resources accessed by computer have proved not to be agile enough for this purpose. Therefore, nurses often resort to learn practices based on oral tradition to consult their colleagues to solve doubts or act based on self-experience instead, resulting in great variability and practices which aren't scientific based, causing a serious risk on patient safety. In recent years, smartphones and their applications have been revealed as indispensable tools in our daily lives. And also, healthcare practitioners are starting to use their mobiles for consulting supporting da scientific data. However, there was no app in our context that integrated multiple con content tools focused on the specific needs of pediatric nurses' practice. Our aim was to create a practical multi-tool that really could help nurses on their daily work, offering them evidence-based and actualized answers to permit giving the best care to their patients. This project has been carried out between 2016 and 2019. In a first step, we collected, updated, and digitalized the relevant contents for the pediatric nurses' practice, from which different tools were developed at second step. After that large process, that not only consisted of developing contents, but it meant to build a structure from nothing, we created Epedia, a free app in Spanish language designed to pediatric nurses' needs, but also useful to other healthcare practitioners as well as training or novel professionals. Nowadays, Epedia includes 52 decision algorithms, 18 uh, clinical scores, 72 charts with content, 86 nursing procedures, 13 calculators, and a lot of audiovisual content. Each tool has been designed so that the user can obtain the information in an intuitive, agile, and interactive way, offering updated and customizable content with instant, instant access at bedside. Beta version for Android and iOS was tested under study in our hospital's emergency department, where a decrease on the use of, of informal sources for resolution of doubts in favor of the app's formal contents were observed in an with an statistically significant difference. We published the app on markets in April 2020 with a special COVID section due to the pandemic situation. On the first year, we had more than 5,000 downloads with a mean of 8,000 views a week presence in more than 10 countries, mainly Spanish speakers, and an excellent rating market. Now we want to introduce you a short video to exemplify what Wikipedia means and what can offer. support healthcare practitioners in clinical environments have shown to allow better decision making, optimize processes, increase the effectiveness and professional self-confidence, as well as reduce variability, errors and costs. The developed app is a pioneer in the file of pediatric nursing being able to become a reference for Spanish speaker countries, providing invaluable help to optimize care for patients' benefit. Thank you so much for your attention. We really encourage you to download Epedia totally free. Even if you are not Spanish speakers, maybe you can find interesting things that can help you in your daily practice. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. That was excellent. Really good. Um, let's move on to our next speaker, which is Fernando Lison. And the title of this presentation is Patient Centered Care at Group Mutuam, is that right? right. With Econ Health Platform. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, good morning. Thanks for being here. My name is Fernando Lison. My presentation is about an experience that a large team of people have developed um, here in Catalonia about the implementation of a software solution on patient-centered care <clears throat> at Group Mutuam on the basis of a software product called Econ uh, Healthcare. There are three parts in that experience. A healthcare provider, Group Mutuam, a product man manufacturer, Econ, and a software consultant company and system integrator, Isalus, uh, why I belong to. Let me introduce you uh, Grumu Tuam. Grumu Tuam is a health and social service provider in Catalonia. It's a non-profit entity that developed its activity in the social economic sector. Its mission is to care for people who suffer chronic diseases and those who are in a situation of dependency and end of life. It provides services such as social health care hospitals, nursing homes, uh, mental health centers, and many more. Isalus is, a, Isalus is a software consultancy which has delivered projects for hospitals and medical centers for many years. It's a value-added reseller of Econ Health product. Econ is a reference manufacturer in cloud technology for Spanish SMEs and with more than 4,000 clients. Grumutuan, several years ago, started the digital transformation of the company, reinforcing their performance through new support tools. One of these tools is Econ Health. Grumutuan aim is to have a new comprehensive healthcare management solution which satisfies the more human side of patient care. And why did Grumutuam choose Econ and Isalus? To meet uh, the management needs and health and social care, to satisfy functional and technical requirements. Econ Health is a patient centric tool and have an easy integration with the public health system. As I said previously, Grumutuan principal target is the human side in patient care. A model of patient-centered care is important because it allows the patient and the family to have a, a, a client journey in which the preferences, desires, and values are taken into consideration and applied from the very beginning. What are the tools requirements? Number one, individualized plan of care, the IPOC. Number two, create individualized tasks. Number three, articulating tasks and automated flow management. And number four, generate alerts, KPIs. Again, there are four key points. Number one, define an IPOC. Number two, a comprehensive estimation of the individual situation. Number three, an evaluation of decision making. And number four, the results as a guide to, pl to planning actions within the IPOC. So what's the situation now? Well, the selection of professionals and their training. Number two, professionals know and understand the patients. Number three, 
facilitate the professionals can empathize with the patients. Number four, evaluating and reviewing the care processes. Number five, interdisciplinary and teamwork as a basic work methodology. F number six, interdisciplinary IPOC as a basic instrument. So what's the next steps? There are two main. First, is adapting existing tools to manage attic nursing language. And the second, establishing indicators that enable evaluating the improvement of the customer experience, user experience, and service satisfaction. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Fernando. I've got to say, this is so much more civilized than the World Cancer Congress, because we did this at Kuala Lumpur. And what happened was you had a spotlight on you from the top. And when the light went out, that was it. You were finished. Okay? <laughs> and, and it caused immense strain and stress with people. And one poor uh, woman from Japan had only got to the first slide when the light went out. And uh, so we gave her a little bit more time. I wasn't in the room, but I heard about it. This is very civilized. And you're all keeping to time. It's making my job easy. Right, let's move on. Let's, uh, I think we've got next is Arnaud Vals Estev. Is that right? Is Arnaud here? No? Yes. Okay. And it is the impact of the implementation of an in-hospital multidisciplinary 3D planning unit, four years experience. Now, no, do we have your presentation? Did you send it through? Yeah. You have, okay. There was some doubt at the beginning. Yeah, I know, sorry for that. I'm sorry, don't worry. So, well, I guess so. First, to say that, well, I can say that it's, it's an honor to be here and have the possibility to present our work. So thank you for that. Good. So I'm Arnaud Valls, I'm engineer, and I'm working in the innovation department and 3D printing service of uh, San Juan de Deo. And I'm here to present the impact of the implementation of a uh, in-hospital 3D pl planning and printing uh, multidisciplinary team unit. Uh, that now have more than four years of, of experience. In this, I'm going to explain some of the aims and the objectives of the abstract that we presented, methods and results and conclusions. But first of all, as aims, uh, we wanted to analyze the model of implementation of our in-house uh, and share it with you, and finally to assess the impact of it in terms of time, costs, and savings that it had. And uh, 3D printing is being a, a revolution. Uh, we are seeing how manufacturing is moving from uh, the manufacture of those medical devices to the uh, bedside, so plan to bedside. And uh, there's opening new frontiers in, in many things. But we are mainly focusing in our unit, uh, the 3D Health unit that was built in 2016, in uh, surgery planning. Um, and what's the model that we have? So our model, we analyzed, and there could be mainly two models, 100% internal with high cost, 100% external as a commodity, but we decided to go for a mixed model, a model in which we could make most of the things internally as up to class two medical devices, so uh, tools to help surgeon in their uh, daily practice, uh, and not going to 3D uh, three class uh, models, which would be implantables. That's something that we outsource. Um, and apart from surgical planning, we also do R&D and, and simulation and teaching. And that's one of the main advantages of this technology, that apart from seeing the images, you can touch it and practice with it, with the real anatomy of the patient before going to, to the surgery. Uh, this process basically involves three more steps than the normal surgery, and we have to take from DICOM, do the segmentation, uh, then go to virtual planning, and then go to 3D printing of tools or the virtual models. Um, with that, we can do things like the one you can see here, which is uh, do the calculation of the resection volume of a tumor of a complex case, a neuroblastoma, and even uh, print the model so that the surgeon can practice with the same anatomy of the patient before going to surgery. Or uh, define uh, the implant that the patient will have or the cutting guides specific for, the, for that patient so that it's really uh, personalized medicine. 
Finally, all this what, what brings its standardization of cases, and with that, uh, we are seeing an impact in cost, time, savings, and quality, also in security. And analyzing that, we've done a study of 70 cases of the last uh, uh, two years uh, in eight different specialties, and the results show that uh, from all the process that I've just shown, the most time consuming, uh, it's the time of printing. More than the segmentation or taking the image, it's the time of, of printing. However, that's time done by an engineer, not by a surgeon, a radiologist, and without the patient there. And the impact that then it has, if we look to different uh, indications, is that we have reductions of time of surgery of up to a mean of 30% of time of surgery when there's the patient. So imagine the impact that it has in terms of anesthesia, ischemia, and, and surgery time. At the end, um, our uh, plan, planning unit is focused mainly in maxillofacial and traumatologic cases, but we have more than eight specialties. We do more than 200 surgeries a year, and the mean cost is eight, uh, that we save per surgery, it's up to 800 euros. Um, that's also so thank you, uh, thanks to that that we can do publications research and that's one of the advantages of having a unit inside the hospital. And finally, just to show you uh, what also helped to have this uh, during COVID pandemic, uh, we were able to create and develop uh, tools, uh, masks when the stock was over so that we can at the point of demand uh, have the solutions in few hours uh, to the surgeons or even send them to uh, other countries with uh, a shared co community that we created during this time. Um, on the future where we are going, and that's uh, reality, moving this planning before surgery to the actual surgery. So um, we are now in maxillofacial surgery uh, looking at the results of the planning that we've done and comparing it online at the time of surgery before closing uh, what would be the, the results, and we can correct. So imagine the impact also inside the, the surgery that, that this could have in uh, really high uh, definition. So as conclusions, we can say that 3D imaging techniques allow assessing complex surgical uh, cases, helping to define complex anatomy, determine surgical approach and training before surgery. 3D printed patient-specific tools can reduce time of surgery in certain cases, especially for guiding complex bone surgeries. Not all 3D plant surgeries need to be printed, and that's a key learning that we've uh, got. Sometimes just with a simulation, 3D simulation and the virtual reality, it's enough. 3D planning shows potential reduction of time and costs of surgery for complex surgeries, and we need to do more research to continue uh, bringing evidence into our literature. So the key to that at, at the end is the multidisciplinary team. So thank you. Thank you very much, Arnold. I always find 3D printing fascinating. I'm not can't quite get my head around it, but it's pretty impressive. So congratulations on what you and the team have done. It's terrific. Um, we're now going to move on to Matthias Grabka. Is Matthias here? Ah, there you go. And it's on innovative UVC technology, decontamination solutions dedicated to hospitals and medical sectors. The floor is yours, Matthias. Thanks so much. Okay, so, uh, buenos dias. Good afternoon, IHF delegates. It's a great pleasure to be able to attend this year conference here in the wonderful city of Barcelona. Uh, firstly, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Mateusz Grabka, and I represent a company called Ecolite Biosafety Technology. I came here today to share the latest proven strategies to fight against hospital-associated infection and pathogen transmission within the health and care sector around the world. If you think about biosafety within hospital environment, you probably have several well-associated protocols and methods, some of which have been around for many years. With the introduction of SARS-CoV-2 in early 2020 and the increase of highly transmittable bacteria around the world face huge challenges. COVID-19 increased the awareness and importance of biosafety, bringing it to the forefront of everyone's attention. Our task was to challenge and question the reality behind this. Over the last two years, we have established two important points. 
First, it was to listen to the hospitals and their expectation about safe, quick, and effective disinfection practices. Second, was answer for this expectation. We will develop and launch a perfect solution to provide the highest level of antimicrobial efficiency using the latest UVC technology. Based on 12 years of experience in the field of professional LED lighting, we created Okta UV system. Okta UV is a system consisting of three devices communicating with each other through dedicated application, to which we obtain the world's best uniformity of UVC radiation. Using the latest technology in the means of LIDAR laser room scanning and algorithm calculation, allow us to precisely provide the UVC dosage necessary to deactivate it, the specific group of pathogens. So, several hundred pathogens, bacteria, viruses, and fungi are tested in many laboratories on the world, and the result presented in scientific publications against UVC radiation. But nevertheless, hospitals expect a confirmation in real condition on specific surface and places. That's why, oh, I'm sorry, it was one, okay. It was one a slide should be behind, but okay. Uh, that's why in cooperation with leading microbiological institutes in Europe, we prepare a methodology for inactivating the escape group of pathogens. One moment, maybe, okay. Escape group of pathogens. And uh, bacteria such as Clostridium difficile, Candida auris, E. coli, or Klebsiella pneumonia. We focus at both of effectiveness of air and surface disinfection. So, based on this methodology, we assume a room, typical hospital room of 30 square meters. The Octa-UV devices have been, have been spaced apart to generate the highest uniformity and coverage. We place a, a culture of bacteria of three different surfaces, steel, plastic, and uh, glass, and six measurement points. This testing met method is crucial because, as we know, the pathogens behave differently of each of them. Oh, sorry, it was the slide, should be one before, <laughs> okay. So this is the leading microbiological institute what we cooperate in, in Europe right now. Okay, uh, what we got the results after this testing method. So, uh, we were recorded six minutes, 10 minutes, and 20 minutes for our each of different part of pathogens. And after this, this type of, uh, of minutes, we got 99.99 .99 reduction from these three different surfaces. Uh, so what is the key of this solution? Uh, the OctaUV system is a solution that can permanently change the approach to conducting for, to quick, safe, and effective disinfection practices in hospitals. Octa-UV can be easily implemented into the daily infection prevention and control standards. User trials demonstrated that Octa-UV is easy to use, safe for both medical equipment, staff and patients, it's fast, effective, and cost-effective, and adaptable into the daily operation and hospi on hospital hygiene. And the most important, uh, to date, we were received in the last few months uh, confirmation and great opinion from more than 35 hospitals in Europe. Uh, and we, you know, we are 100% sure that this solution should be a new standard in every single hospital uh, in Europe, a new era that can save, then work safe and protect every patient in the hospital. Thanks so much. Thank you very much indeed. Um, one of the projects that UICC is leading with a number of our other organizations at the moment is uh, the challenge of AMR, which a lot of people wonder why cancer organization is involved in this. It's because the forecast from some of our specialists is that in 10, 20 years time, most cancer patients will be dying of an infection. They won't be dying of their actual cancer. That'll be the major problem they have to face. Anyway, let's move on to the next one. Um, we've got Dr. Nouf Al-Noon. Uh, Dr. Nuf is here, good. 
and it's on the COVID-19 pandemic, the effect on patient utilization of telemedicine in Dubai Health Authority, DHA. Welcome, the floor is yours. Hello everyone, uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Dr. Anouf Ali Announ. I am a family physician working in Dubai Health Authority. Uh, I'm very glad to be here and really thank you for this opportunity to share our result with the telemedicine during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, mainly, I will share our results of the research that we conducted. Uh, we studied the effect of the COVID pandemic on the utilization of telemedicine in Dubai. I will be heading in uh, four titles. I'll just speak briefly about the telemedicine in Dubai. Then I will share with you the result that we conducted about telemedicine. Um, and then I'll give you a bit of conclusion of our result. Uh, telemedicine consultation was uh, launched recently in 17 of December 2019, which is almost three months before the announcement of the COVID-19 pandemic. Our telemedicine consultation, it's a very unique thing because it's a live video between the doctor and the patient from their home. They can use and access this telemedicine service through their telephone application. This was established uh, in fulfillment of UAE Charter, which is the 50 charters. Uh, UAE uh, Vice President uh, pronounced this service as to ensure the continuity of care for all citizens and the availability of this service for all citizens 24-7. Our primary objective of this study was to study the effect of the COVID-19 pandemic on patient utilization of telemedicine in Dubai. Our secondary objective was to see what are the factors that we are associated with the utilization of telemedicine. Our method, uh, methodology, uh, our study was a multi-center comparative study. We uh, took telemedicine visits as well as the PHC visit. This study was mainly on the ambulatory health service in Dubai. Um, so we had a benchmarking of the visit to the primary health care, primary health care sector, which is the initial visits. The group, we classify two groups. One of them is the duration before the pandemic, which is from January to February, and the duration during the pandemic as it is ongoing pandemic. Our exclusion, we exclude patients who had the used telemedicine or visit the PHC during March or April, because at, globally it was a lockdown period in, as well in the UAE. So only patient most recent visit we included in our study, because as you know, some of the patient will visit telemedicine and attend to the PHC as well. So we took in consideration and we took the most recent visit for these patients to exclude uh, duplicates. Uh, our study included 121,035 patients in the study. First group, which is including the period before pandemic, which is 55,622 patients. And during the pandemic, 65,413 patients. We took some variables such as age, nationality, the gender, and show to no show to the appointment, and the complaint, which was based on to acute, chronic, or COVID-19 related. And we based our diagnosis based on the ICD coding used by the physicians. Uh, first result is the patient characteristic. What interesting we noticed that more female prefer to use telemedicine, and it was statistically significant. Uh, more UAE national also as well was noticed to use telemedicine and uh, with the PHC and telemedicine more actually patients preferred to go to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic during the COVID-19 pandemic to the PHC. And we related mostly because it was the most screening center in Dubai, the primary healthcare sector was the main screening centers and the main gate for triaging and classifying and uh, shifting patient to secondary care. If we go to the other characteristic or variables and we compare between each uh, column, like for the telemedicine and the primary healthcare sectors, we notice as well female are more common in the telemedicine, despite whether it's with overall group or in the telemedicine group. Regarding the complaint, we notice COVID-19 is higher in the PHC, chronic disease was higher in telemedicine, a similar study has been published that shows utilization of telemedicine mostly for chronic condition, but in our study we included COVID-19 and acute, and we still notice some patients still utilize telemedicine for acute complaints. 
What we have noticed significantly was the trend of utilization. As the pandemic announced, we noticed significant jump of utilization of telemedicine in the primary health care sectors in Dubai. Our result, as for the primary objective, the utilization of telemedicine during the pandemic increased significantly from 0.2 to 14% and was statistically significant. In conclusion, this is the conclusion of our study that I shared with you, but I would just say uh, telemedicine has been well known as effectiveness as used for different consultation. But in our study, uh, telemedicine has shown its effectiveness in utilization as a source of utilization during pandemic to ensure the continuity uh, to care to our patient. As we all had the same issue that our frontliner were overwhelmed, the hospital were overwhelmed, patients were anxious to attend, and we lost a lot of patients because of the pandemic and the shift of resources. So just to keep in mind that telemedicine is an excellent and has shown its effectiveness to ensure the continuity of care to our patient in time of disasters or pandemic. I think that was my last slide. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. It'll be interesting to see post-COVID, whenever we get to that point, the degree to which telemedicine becomes business as usual for much of the, what, what it was not doing before COVID. So thank you very much for that presentation. Shall we move on to the next one? Uh, we have Dr. Paula Trulunen. And this is, how do we manage to start remote care processes in a few weeks? So thank you very much. The floor is yours. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for, you for your invitation. My name is Paula Turunen, and I come from Finland. I am an adolescent psychiatry, but I work as a medical chief in our development team. So I'm talking to you about how did we manage to start remote care process just in a few weeks. Um, before 2020, we had zero appointments, video appointments in our hospital. Um, we have had few projects, but it was not very successful because we didn't know how to manage with safety and security requirements. Our implementations were too expensive or we couldn't find volunteers. So you can mainly say uh, there was too big change resistant to start video meetings, although the patients asked for them. But this groundwork we made became handy later because when the COVID-19 started, it suddenly wasn't safe to meet patients in present. So we started to meet them by phone whenever it was possible, especially in psychiatric clinics. But this was hard and unpleasant for the staff and especially for the patients. So we were asked to implement video remote appointments in our hospital and our management gave us one week to do it. And I must say, our hospital is a medial-sized central hospital in the southern part of Finland. There is about 172,000 inhabitants, so it's quite small in this scale. You have very big hospitals in, in all other places. So, <clears throat> but how did we manage? Um, as you can see, we had in 2012, we had already nine video appointments per day and uh, in this year we have had approximately 15 per day. This means 5% of all our appointments in our hospital and we have a call to have 30 video meetings per day in the year 2026. Uh, there are a few main things we would like to show you. Uh, we at first, we constructed a multi-professional team, which included ICT, project manager, ICT nurse, and a physician, so that the team knew the needs of the stakeholders, we knew the security requirements, and we were able to make a process architect description, and we also utilized the former projects and findings and cooperated with stakeholders, professionals, and also, of course, patient representatives. For one week, we met only in teams, meetings, planning the implementation, doing nothing else. And the first thing we found is that it is important to find easy to use, safe and cheap platform. And we choose Microsoft Teams 
because it was already available in our hospital, it was familiar for our staff, and in Finland almost everyone has an email, an internet, at least in mobile phone, so it was achievable for patients too. And this platform was strictly verified by our central informatics security officers that it was safe and reliable. And of course, we had patients' representatives who gave us the final touch in the procedure itself, but also in the patient guidelines. Uh, the second important thing is to focus on training and support. Invest in credibility means that you speak the language, they understand, and you know the needs of your target audience. Our trainers were ICT nurse and physician from this development team, so we knew the new way of working and could discuss about the fears and feelings as well as the expectations and consequences to minimize the change resistance, which was very big. The procedure itself was easily adapted, but it's still important to offer support structure to promote adaptation afterwards. So we had teams space for Q&A, we held support clinics and gave us space to collaboration. And of course, they could any time give us a call to ask if they had problems. Finally, it is important to keep evaluating and developing this new system. We have ongoing survey by Beverable for patients and professionals uh, to develop this procedure easier and safer. We have now version two ongoing and it's much better than the first one. And as I said, our goal is to establish patient video appointments also in somatic clinics because these were mainly in psychiatric clinic. To succeed in this, we need to map the current process with them and find out the tasks they can do better or faster with the video. We think this is the only way to help change resistant and make them do it. And as I said, in 2026, we want, our goal is that the 10% of all receptions, which means 30 per day, should be remoted, and this seems to be achievable. Here are my team and um, our contact information if you want to ask more. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. That's fascinating. I, you know, I've seen that in the cancer community around the world as well more um, interaction on Teams and Zoom, etc. Again, it'll be interesting how that continues in the future. Um, okay, let's move on to the next one. Do we have uh, Benjamin CEO here? Hello, Benjamin. Um, and Benjamin's going to be talking about telehealth adoption by international patients at a major US academic medical center during COVID-19. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. How are you? It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Ben Sayo. I'm the uh, Global Business Development Director at Cedar sinai uh, Cedar sinai is a major academic medical center in Los Angeles, and today I'll kind of show you a study that we've done on telehealth adoption at the height of the pandemic, uh, both at the hospital level and also in particular for international patients. So prior to the pandemic, telehealth adoption has really lagged in the United States, primarily due to lack of reimbursement and uh, regulatory barriers. But of course, uh, when the pandemic hits, a lot of those barriers have come down almost overnight and the adoption has really skyrocketed um, and led to an explosion of telehealth across the United States and of course, globally. Uh, for a patient seeking care abroad, uh, this period has proven to be complex and confusing. Um, primarily due to, again, global restrictions on travel uh, and regulatory uncertainties around conducting telehealth across borders. So a lot of uncertainty around conducting telemedicine between countries. Um, so uh, before the pandemic, a lot of research has been already existing for telehealth. But that, that proves that the, you know, it does contribute to expanded access, uh, reduce time and exposure, and then reduce disease exposure, and then positive patient experience. Um, however, the global regulations haven't really kept in pace with the demand. And so again, this, this study has really highlights that need uh, going forward. Uh, a study has been conducted by USKIP. Uh, USKIP is a consortium of US hospitals with major international patient programs. And the study has shown that approximately 100,000 to 200,000 patients travel every year to the United States and has been increasing uh, year on year. Um, and again, they do come from, for some of the most complex conditions, things that they cannot treat in their own home countries, uh, and again, technologies that are not available in their own home, home countries. 
And over here, you'll kind of see what service lines they really do come for, and then the, the origins of where they usually come from. Of course, in March 2020, uh, when the U.S. went into a lockdown, uh, a lot of patients could not travel. And so uh, hospitals have been hurriedly trying to understand the global regulation landscape around telehealth. Uh, Cedar sinai in particular, uh, we've been working with the other hospitals as well to truly under, really understand uh, the global landscape around telemedicine. Uh, we are a, uh, the largest academic medical center in the United States in the western, pro, in the western side, 886 beds, and we do see approximately 2,500 international patients per year from around 100 countries. So again, this has been a key priority for us in really maintaining access for our patients, uh, for international patients. So our study really looked at three aims. Uh, one, we wanted to examine telehealth adoption at our medical center uh, during the study period, uh, again, for one year, starting from March 2020, when the, when the COVID lockdowns have happened, all the way up until uh, February 2021. And number two, we wanted to compare those findings for international patients. So again, we see around 2,500 patients. We wanna make sure that those patients have continued access uh, to our medical center. And number three, we wanted to see if there's any disparity, if any, there's any difference between the adoption telehealth uh, for international patients versus our local patients in Los Angeles. So this is what we found. This is our data. Uh, you'll see this is a one year of data. Uh, prior to the pandemic, um, our medical center saw approximately 66,800 outpatient visits monthly. Uh, less than 1% of those visits were conducted via telehealth. Uh, you can see right here, right in April 2020, almost 80% of our outpatient visits were conducted via telehealth. Uh, during the pandemic, our volumes have dropped approximately, I would say, 40% down to 41,000, which is the monthly average for our outpatient visits. And approximately 33% were seen via telehealth during the study period. Uh, this is our international cohorts. Um, so we do see approximately uh, 750 international patients uh, monthly at a medical center per month. Uh, again, same as a medical center, less than 1% of those are done via telehealth. Uh, when the pandemic hits, approximately we dropped 50% in volume. So again, similar to our medical center. Uh, and 21% were actually seen via telehealth. And we were able to maintain access for majority of the patients that were seeking care at our medical center. So uh, what we found from this study really was that we were able to maintain access for international patients. And we really did it through, again, a consortium of, the pay, of, of our US academic hospitals where we really leverage each other's experience, knowledge, and we also have engaged some of the leading um, law firms to kind of gain guidance on how and best to uh, conduct telehealth. Uh, however, what we've seen here was that international patients were definitely seen less uh, than our local patients via telehealth. Um, and again, a lot of factors contribute to this, but the key factors were really around higher complexity and, 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 and complexity around the international patients. You know, they do present with more complex issues and harder to treat issues. And number two is, again, uncertainty of permissibility of telehealth across borders. Again, uh, a lot of patients we just we didn't have guidance on for those specific countries, and we were not able to see them via telehealth. And so again, what this has really shown is the importance of really global policies needs to really inform uh, regulators to improve access to care for patients wherever they are. And so again, as we kind of come out of this pandemic, I think it'll be increasingly important uh, for governments to, again, as pe people go more global, uh, for them to really address uh, this issue going forward. So thank you. Benjamin, that was really, really interesting. I, as a, an individual who spends a lot of time with the WHO and other international groups, I'll be interested in who is the inter international group that we would need to talk to to sort that out. I'm not too sure who that would be, but uh, maybe we can talk afterwards. Right, let's move on to the next one. Is Simon Minford here? Hello, Simon. Simon is uh, going to talk about developing a tele-neonatology program in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Over to you. Excellent, thank you very much. Thank you everybody and thank you for your warm welcome to Barcelona. My name is Simon Minford and I'm a clinical innovation consultant at Aldehyde Children's Hospital in Liverpool, England. I'm going to talk today about our rapid deployment, but um, before, you, before we jump to that, we have to, to look at the geography. Telehealth deals with geography very well and uh, the two sites I'm going to refer to are the Liverpool Women's Hospital 
and uh, the geography was pretty much established because it was founded in like 1795 and whilst it's moved around the city it's, it's very much a fixed point. Aldehe is a much uh, younger hospital, it was only founded before the First World War, um, but they are uh, separated by about two to three miles, but that's a very important two to three miles. Both hospitals are very high-end tertiary level hospitals. Uh, there's about 8,000 deliveries in the Liverpool Women's. It's our regional centre. Uh, they've got a 44-bed NICU, and they deal with the sickest infants on the patch. And the flip side of that is Alderhey is the largest children's hospital in the UK with tertiary services, um, a nine-cot surgical neonatal HDU, as well as a 22-bed PICU with ECMO, cardiac surgery, brain surgery, the full nine yards. So they're two very high end. And the staff cover both sides. Um, and the challenge, so we've got the geography, what's the challenge? So the challenge was that whilst both, whilst the babies need both hospitals to get the care they need, the neonatologists were hit really hard. Just prior to lockdown, there was three of 14 on long-term leave. And then all of a sudden, uh, that was brought down to seven of 14, and it doesn't matter what workforce you have, if you lose 50% of a, an irreplaceable workforce, there's trouble ahead, and that's what we were facing. Even if we cut absolutely everything out, we were going to lose 40% of clinical patient-facing time. Um, and the service was completely unsustainable, but the babies were still being born, and these are babies uh, that are anywhere, you know, 500 grams, maybe less, maybe more, uh, with uh, high acuity. So what did we do? So the team was a core team. Um, I led the project, and uh, my right-hand woman was Leila Brown. And essentially, that was the clinical and digital team. And we worked really closely with the clinical leads. Now, thankfully, our clinical leads across both hospitals were already on a journey in developing a, a brand new uh, NICU in uh, Alderhey, but that's a story for another day. Um, it involved getting them together and say, what do you need? And this was more about connecting clinicians to clinicians with the family, as opposed to direct patient interface. And our one stipulation was we needed visual fidelity that allowed us to make remote clinical life and death decisions around surgical intervention. And that was our one, we needed to have this. So uh, our, we, we got together with uh, our partners in Teladoc um, and uh, got some high-end equipment together and um, put together a package uh, and we didn't have fancy shiny stuff to start it off with. We had borrowed equipment. You'll see a picture in a minute. But essentially, the impact was immediate and significant. Um, services that would have had to shut down redirect out of our region, and our region covers about 5 million. Um, it, the impact would have had ripples across the northwest, the north of England. So it would, it would have been very significant. But the flip side of that was that we went from a situation where we had not enough staff to there was no locums, no overtime worked through the duration of the project. Um, it, it, uh, the clinicians had to change their rota, but we developed these core principles that we would deliver. And Aldehey were delivering daily neonat, uh, having daily neonatology ward rounds from the consultants that were isolating at home uh, and shielding at home. They were delivering urgent and ad hoc advice. They were responding to acutely deteriorating neonates. And the ANNPs, the Advanced Neonatal Nurse Practitioners that were on the ward, were getting the support they needed to keep things going. The flip side was the surgeons in Alder Hay were dialing into the women's, delivering a regular surgical ward round, reviewing deteriorating neonates, specifically around abdominal problems, and identifying exactly when they needed transfer, because transfer was a challenge because the ambulance systems were overwhelmed. So, so all of that, the timeliness and the, the decision making was brought right to the bedside. Um, we even did urgent ad hoc virtual surgical reviews, as well as in our back pocket, we, we, if there was any time critical surgical interventions, we had a mechanism whereby we, the surgeons could talk the neonatologists through. Um, and this was set up and clinical agreement was found very quickly, which is a credit to the clinical teams. And here you can see the devices in action. Um, 
what you can see uh, is our loaned equipment uh, because the other stuff was uh, uh, being built. But um, in the top picture, you can see a father. Uh, on the telehealth device is the neonatal surgeon. Uh, on the phone is mum in the labour ward and the baby. And what you can see on the other side is that neonatologist um, and the neonatal nurse. Everybody that baby needed was right at that bedside. And they, uh, they, they, it was amazing how that uh, happened. In the bottom picture, you can see in Alder Hay, um, uh, yes, that really is a cobbled together piece of equipment, but what it did do was uh, bring that expertise to the bedside, um, supporting the junior doctors, and that's a, a, a consultant ANNP, in delivering the care the neonates needed. Um, but despite doing this clinical agreement and developing things really quickly, we never forgot our true north. We always asked the parents, um, and we were stunned by the response. Everything was super positive. Um, they actually got more interaction with their neonatal surgeon than they ever had previously, because previously that was a clinician to clinician on the phone in the office discussion. Now it was a bedside discussion. The parents could ask questions. The consent, the understanding, knowing the plan for their baby, was significant. And actually, even though we sort of naturally think it's not as good, 40% of the parents said it was just as good as a face-to-face. -face. That floored me, that stat. I just couldn't believe it. Um, and at the end of it, no parent was left dissatisfied with the, the care they received despite this rapid implementation. And you can just see in this timeline, and we're just looking at the start of it, um, we had already started a journey, as I said. We were looking at virtual care options in March. Then lockdown hit at the end of March, and we quickly looked at training. Got our first robot installed by the end of the month, and I spent the next two weeks training every neonatologist and surgeon in a cascade training methodology. And as you can see, as the timeline goes on, um, we quickly needed, said we need more kit and got that, and our consultations have continued uh, across the site. Um, and that's my details. That's a, a great story and congratulations. I'm sure the parents really appreciated the way you resolved the challenges of the two sites during a COVID challenge. So thank you very much. Um, let's move on to Dr. Juan A. Hueto, Madrid. I've got to say, seeing the word Madrid in Barcelona is very unusual. Very, very unusual. Um, and he's going to talk about artificial intelligence-based pre predictive algorithm for strategic planning of surgical, surgical demand and compliance with waiting list deadlines. A very long title. Thank you. First of all, thank you for giving us the opportunity to share our, our work here. I am Juan Antonio Hueto. I am uh, the Corporate uh, Surgical uh, Process Coordinator of the uh, Catalan Institute of Health. The Catalan Institute of Health is the corporation that gathered the public-owned healthcare providers in the region of Catalonia, including eight university hospitals and primary care and socio-sanitary facilities spread to service all the territories of the region. One of the major challenges in countries with universal healthcare systems like in Spain and Catalonia is to fit surgical demand to the surgical capacity of hospitals. When demand exceeds the capacity, a waiting list is generated. Every day, hundreds of surgical orders are generated in our system by our surgeons, which are classified according to our regulations, depending on the diagnosis and the procedure in 81 uh, types shown in the, in the slide, called monitoring groups. Monitoring groups have different priority of care according to the severity of the disease. Guaranteed waiting time limits are established by law. In every hospital, every monitoring group generates its own waiting list, and to face it, have a specific set of resources to carry out these surgeries. Our staff at hospitals responsible of managing the surgical process have been doing their job of balancing demand and capacity in all monitoring groups based on their own experience and empiric uh, knowledge. The goal of the ALBA project is to provide our hospitals with a system based on data to help them to better planning of the surgical resources and comply with the waiting time limits set by legislation. 
ALBA system is an AI and machine learning system that feeds from that data of our corporate information systems based on SAP. ALBA is made of four main elements. The first is an algorithm that analyzes the historical activity carried out using machine learning to identify rules, patterns, and programming behaviors, the weekly distribution of sessions by services, restrictions or constraints, interventions that are regularly scheduled together, etc. The second is a powerful waiting list dashboard. The third is a simulation tool which for a given period of time in a calendar makes a prediction of activity and calculates a result of compliance with the guarantee periods. Finally, the fourth element is made up of the tools for parameterization and integration with the corporate information system. This is the waiting list control pan panel, which allow us to see the situation of the entire hospital by surgical blocks, by surgical services, or by monitoring groups, and also the structure of the waiting list in terms or guarantee times. Here are some screenshots of calculations of the planned activity and the graphical and numerical results of the fulfillment prediction of the guarantee period. The predictive scenario is made by the algorithm reproducing the previous programming rules and behaviors on the calendar. We can carry out different simulations or prescriptive scenarios by changing the distribution patterns of the sessions to the services, creating new sessions or commissioning activity to external partners, providers, etc. The chosen scenario is finally transferred to the corporate information system to be executed. Once the study period is completed, the system makes a comparison of its predictions and the final result obtained. The causes of deviations are identified and analyzed and a report is generated. Finally, as example, we present the summary analysis of a study period of the pilot phase of the project carried out in one of the surgical blocks of Valdebron University Hospital in Barcelona. The result is shown in a confusing matrix that shows an overall predictive success of 72% and the causes of deviation. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much. And I think that concludes. Is there anyone who wants to do a... There's one more, okay? Who's this then? Uh, Louis, yes, right, sorry. Louis Magalhães. So my apologies. The, the best to the last, of course. Come on up. He said he was going to entertain us because he, he feared that everyone would be leaving by the end. So. Oh, it's good to see that so, so many people is here, uh, still here. At, at this time of the day, the last presentation of this Congress, I think. So good to see you all here. Uh, I think he, he will deserve a massive round of applause okay. at the end, no matter what happens. <laughs> yeah. You have not okay. Thank you. Thank you. So my name is Luis, and uh, I'm coming from Switzerland. As you can see by my name, is very Swiss. Um, I'm not going to talk to you about the great Swiss chocolate or the great Swiss mountains. I'm not going to talk to you about the amazing banking system because maybe your uh, IRS tax offices will wait for me outside. But uh, I'm going to talk about um, a great disruptive technology coming out from Switzerland. So um, I work for a company called Clinarium. And uh, what we do and what we have been doing is since 2013 already working with the electronic health records using the patient data in a complying way so um, gdpr hipaa compliant to support um, patients um, how do we support the patients with that we um, bring to them new um, medication so we work with research institutions by uh, bringing them to the patients that they need, but at the same time bringing to the patients the medicine that they need. This is um, 
a very um, we can bring very very uh, large discussion uh, how is it possible to do that this is just an example of some uh, institutions across the world that have uh, working with us they collaborate with us they uh, believe in the technology and they are doing it so it's possible to share patient data in a way that you can support and bring them new medicine uh, the technology that we develop, it's patent, it's called a federated system. Um, basically, we install this technology in different hospitals across the world. Doesn't matter the coding that they are using, doesn't matter the language that they are using. And the beauty of it is that uh, there is no need to extract data. So the data is never moved from the source to be queerable. Um, one of the challenges that you have maybe seen, if you are related to this data sharing, data access, is that there is so many data models, so many data uh, formats outside. Each system that you are using, that you are accessing patient data or storing data or collecting data or is just use your own uh, format. So we are agnostic also from data formats. We work, um, for example, in a, in a European project called Eden, where we are supporting institutions, all mopping their format. So we can consume um, any, any kind of, of, of data format. What we do, and this might be very technical, but just to, to help you to understand that we just offer the technology without no cost to the institutions that want to participate in this project. Um, there is no data being uh, extracted from the source. Everything is just behind the firewall. We installed um, our, our server in the hospital itself. It's all the data is first uh, de-identified and then we start launching in this data, the queries. So in this case, I wanted to talk to you about the, um, the new model training that we have, AI, um, artificial intelligence, that supported one of the um, recent cases um, in, in rare diseases. So I could, I could share with you many other use cases in many other uh, uh, studies, but I think this one is, is a very interesting one. So we, uh, we went to some hospitals in Turkey um, one pharmaceutical company wanted to find patients undiagnosed with the specific rare diseases. Just using our query system, we supported them to find almost 15% more patients than, than the physicians, than the, the doctors in the hospitals could find. But then, by launching an algorithm from a company called Volve Global, they developed the algorithm, finding the pattern for the patients that were undiagnosed. So we, we are working together. We found almost 90% more um, rare disease undiagnosed patients. And this is how uh, we believe that we can support and transform the healthcare, not just in Switzerland, not just in Europe, but worldwide. As you could see before, we have already many partners. I would like to invite any of you here today or any of you listening out there, if you want to be part of this global network, if you want to be part of this global transformation, it is possible, it is possible today to share data, to access data in a GDPR compliant way, and many others are doing it. Many patients, many researchers are profiting from that. And here are my contacts. If you go to Switzerland, don't just enjoy the chocolate and the Swiss banks, banking, but come and visit us. Thank you. Uh, you obviously don't know I live in Switzerland. Oh, okay. <laughs> I live in Geneva, I eat too much chocolate by far, and I used to run a bank a long time ago, so that's a strange old world, it's all coming back to haunt me, and GDPR, if you can get past GDPR, you're a better man than me. Um, 
Okay, uh, we don't seem to have any questions. I've just checked, unless the team at the back can tell me. I think Daniel West is asking questions from the previous session because they don't make sense to me. Are there any questions in the room for any of the presenters? Any questions in the room for any of the presenters? Please put your hand up. I know it's been a long three days and the arms are tired, but if there is anyone who has a burning question for anyone, that would be useful. No? Okay. None of the question, presenters want to ask one of the other presenters a question? Okay. Um, now, we've heard two things here. We heard you were saying that data and exchange of information globally is difficult, and you've just presented saying there are ways around it. So I think you should, you should talk, definitely, um, but, because I'm more in, inclined to be on your side. So I think your way that you're doing it, it, it must be, you know, I'm not too sure how that works, but it sounds fascinating because it bypasses a lot of the challenges we have around the world about finding, for example, enough people for trials, um, which is extremely difficult for many companies. Um, maybe you two should have a chat afterwards. Um, anything at all from anyone? Well, I don't see the point of lingering. We do, I do encourage you all to the, go into the closing ceremony, which I believe is starting in 15 minutes. Time to get a coffee, cup of tea, or a Fanta today, which was great. I like the sugar intake. That was much better than the water option for the last two days. Thank you very much to all the presenters. I think they deserve a round of applause. Well kept to time and excellent contribution. Well done. <laughs>